Welcome to the Academic Woman Amplified Podcast. I'm your host, Kathy Mazak, tenured full professor, mom of three, and firm believer that the culture of academia needs to change radically. Women are revolutionizing academia within institutions that were not built for us. If you're ready to reject the culture of overwork, kick guilt and overwhelm to the curb, and amplify your voice to make a real impact on your field without breaking down or burning out, you're in the right place. And it all starts with writing. Let's go. When academics join writing programs like the ones that we run, they often say that they're searching for accountability. I hear this countless times. The problem that people come to our programs with is often, I can't find time to write, or I feel overwhelmed, and I know I have to get writing done, but it keeps falling to the bottom of the list, or something like that, feeling pulled in a thousand directions, feeling like your career is kind of chaotic. And what happens as a result of that chaos is that you kind of don't get to your writing or that it doesn't occupy the place in your career that you want it to. So the solution that so many academics looking for programs think they need is accountability. Oh, good, they think when they join a writing program, now I have accountability. That's what I really need. People around me to keep me in line, somebody to hold me to my word. I hear this over and over again. Well, I want to suggest to you that the idea of accountability, the idea that you need some external person holding you accountable is rooted in patriarchy. It says that you, academic who has been socialized as a woman, are not to be trusted to complete your own work. You're not to be trusted to set your own goals or to meet your own deadlines. You are not to be trusted to prioritize your writing. Patriarchy is built on the mistrust of women. So when we are searching for accountability, we are buying into a patriarchal system that mistrusts women. I'll give you some examples of how this system, you know, that we are living in mistrusts women. Really basic examples in the U.S. context. You know, women couldn't hold bank accounts or lines of credits without a male cosigner until the 1970s. So women were not to be trusted with money. We've seen a huge rise in cesarean births because women are not to be trusted to push the baby out. Obviously, not the only reason for cesareans, but (laughs) makes us question, like, why? Why, if women have been birthing for hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of years, why a sudden uptick in cesarean births in the past 30 years or so? It's a mistrust of the female body. (laughs) You know, think about abortion legislation, think about how policed and regulated the female body is. Because we can't trust women. That's the message of the patriarchy. So saying that you need accountability to do things might be you distrusting yourself. If you're listening to this podcast, you probably have accomplished more in your life than most people, and you actually didn't need constant prodding to do it. People don't get PhDs because they were prodded to by somebody else. In one of my favorite books, Playing Big by Tara Moore, she talks about discovering your inner mentor. I'm going to quote to you from page 44 of the book. She says, Though dressed in the guise of women's empowerment, all the encouragement for women to find the right mentors and the right advice is often underneath the same old message, telling them to turn away from their own intuitions and wisdom to privilege guidance coming from others instead. In order to grow or to lead, right, 
or to play big, as Tara Moore puts it, you need to learn to trust yourself. The endless search for accountability is based in a fundamental distrust in your ability to get your writing done for yourself. And let's get real. Besides being rooted in this mistrust, the belief in the need for accountability kind of paints you as weak, right? Like you're too weak to enforce your own boundaries. You're too weak to stand up for yourself. You're too weak to direct or design your career. And of course, that's just bunk, right? Like you're not weak. You are operating within a system that was not meant for you. And doing so like very reasonably causes moments of self-doubt, whole years of self-doubt sometimes. It is utterly paternalistic to think that you would not get your writing done because you don't have some kind of dominant figure there, quote unquote, holding you accountable like a father watching the clock until curfew. So when you ask for accountability, you are buying into this idea that you are weak and not to be trusted. So you might be asking yourself, okay, Kathy, fine. Then why haven't I been getting my writing done if it's not lack of accountability? Well, maybe because, you know, you haven't been clear on all of these ways that academia is like built deliberately to keep you from writing, right? If you've been over and over again kind of blaming yourself for not getting your writing done and holding on to the consequences of social structures, holding on to them as personal faults, then yeah, like it makes sense <laughs> that, you, that you've that you been thinking you need accountability because you are, you are blaming yourself for acting within social structures that you cannot as one person change. So what I want you to think about today, my dear podcast listeners, <laughs> is that maybe you don't need accountability or maybe you don't need accountability in the format that you're thinking. In other words, this outside thing that you're looking for and that, oh, without this like outer force compelling me to get my writing done, I won't be able to do it. Instead, I want to talk about three things, and the last one's the most important. <laughs> I want to talk about three things that will give you that accountability, but not in a patriarchal way, in a feminized way. And those things are self-trust, boundaries, and most importantly, community. Okay, let's talk first about this idea of self-trust. So I already mentioned that Tara Moore calls this your inner mentor, but I want to mention another writer who I really admire, and her name is Alexander Frazen. And she talks about that inner trust as being a combination of listening to your head and your gut. So she calls it the hut, like the head plus gut. And she calls it the voice of instinct and intuition, that inexplicable feeling of what's right for you and you alone. So one of the things that especially people socialized as women experience is that lack of trust of that inner voice. And so it is kind of a revolutionary act to start listening to that hut or that inner mentor rather than seeking from the outside your quote unquote accountability. And those of you listening might be thinking, Kathy, yeah, 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 that's great. <laughs> but it's easier for me to just seek outward accountability. And I hear you on that. <laughs> it is easier. It is easier, which is why you have to do it over and over again. It's not a sustainable change. Having somebody else hold you accountable in this kind of patriarchal way that is what people are usually referring to when they talk about accountability is not a sustainable way to make change. <laughs> it's not something that's going to really help you as a writer to hold on to your writing time or to make decisions about your time that 
favor your writing or your career, that's not a sustainable, it's like a band-aid to a bigger problem. And by developing self-trust, listening to your inner mentor, consulting your hut when you're thinking about making decisions, it will help you to not need to go searching outside of yourself for accountability. So self-trust, that's the most important, or that's the important first thing that I want to talk about, self-trust. The second thing that you need instead of outward accountability is boundaries. And this is something like, you know, there's a lot of popular talk about boundaries, but it's a really useful way to think about how you create spaces for different parts of your career, the different things you want to do in your career and your life, how you, you know, hold those spaces and how you can be firm around time since time is like the non-renewable resource, right? (laughs) Like you can't get it back ever. So you really need to be careful with how you spend your time. And let me be real clear, how you spend your time, the way that the activities of your career or the activities of your career that you spend time doing is your career. So let me say that again. The activities that you spend time doing in your work day That is your career. So take a minute to think about how you spend your work days. Think about how much time do you spend on email? Think about where email falls in your day. Think about how you give your time away to other people. And that causes that writing falling to the bottom of the list thing to happen to you. Think about the urgent tasks that pull at you and that you listen and give into that pull. That's your career. Like, so I'll ask it in a different way. Do you want email to be your career? (laughs) Like, do you want at the end of the day to be able to say, I responded quickly to email. My great contribution (laughs) to the world was responding to emails, or my great contribution to the world was putting out other people's fires that seemed urgent at the time, but in retrospect were not urgent and not important either. So maybe this is a little bit tough love-ish for you, but when we talk about boundaries, that's really what we need to talk about. We need to think about like how are we holding firm to what's important and cup filling and the things that are going to make our careers better. I will suggest writing is one of those things, if not the most important thing. How are we putting boundaries around that time? So I want to tell you a story about boundaries that comes from my experience as a associate director in my department. So when I was an associate professor, I was asked to do the inevitable thing, right? I was tenured, and so it was time to be called into service to our department. At least that's the way it worked in my department. And I was clear in all fronts that I did not want to be the department chair. But a very dear colleague of mine was leaving the chairship And another very, very dear colleague of mine was taking it over. And both of them wanted me to serve as the associate chair. Now, the position was an interim position, but in our university, interim could last two months or it could last years and years. So I was like very wary of the whole situation, but I was like, I'm going to hear you out. So I remember my two colleagues, who I also consider friends, kind of sitting me down and saying, like, look, we think you should do this thing. You're going to like the role. We really need you in department leadership because you're a leader. They were both great leaders themselves, so they were very persuasive. (laughs) But I thought, you know, like, let me be, like, super honest right from the start. And I looked them in the eyes and I said, look, before I say yes to taking on this role of the interim associate chair. I want you to know that I will save myself. 
I will not sacrifice my mental or my physical well-being for the department. If things look bad, I will not hesitate to jump ship and let it sink. So those are harsh words, but they were absolutely true. And I had said it before in different contexts during my career, like I will not sacrifice myself to other people's ideas of what I should do. I will not do it. So that was me trying to like put up a boundary, like right from the start, like, okay, I'll do this job as long as I can also not sacrifice the essence of who I am as a professor, as a teacher and a researcher, as long as I can keep doing those things and I can, you know, that's what my boundary is going to be. Of course, (laughs) That is not what happened. (laughs) So I was all strong and I said yes. And I was like all with my speech about letting the ship sink and jumping. (laughs) But that's not what I did. What actually happened was that both my physical and mental health severely suffered. And it was a slow deterioration. It wasn't like instantly I could tell this wasn't going to go my way. It was really... It was slow, not that slow, but it was, it was slow. I was like really determined to keep my research line going and I had funding, like I had a grant project that was funding research assistants to collect data and I was running that project. You know, I was also teaching, but most importantly, like I was learning how the heck to do the new job. And that required me to be physically present in the office all or most days. So whereas before, you know, I had that kind of like typical professor schedule that I could kind of fudge around. Like I was mostly working nine to five because that's when my kids were in school or daycare. But, you know, I had some flexibility in terms of like physically having to show up in my office and be available to people. Well, as the associate chair, I had to be available to students and other faculty during certain hours, like not 40 hours a week. But like I had to be there. I had to show my face. So the first thing that happened was that breakfast slipped and then lunch. (laughs) So in the morning rush of getting kids to school and getting to the office, like by a certain time, I basically stopped eating breakfast and packing lunch. So I ate greasy cafeteria food twice a day. So I would like skip breakfast. I would go over to the cafeteria, try to catch breakfast there. It would normally be like I was trying to get something that was protein packed, but that ended up kind of being greasy eggs and sausage, and it was not good. (laughs) And I gained 20 pounds that year. You know, I had a nice workout routine that I was doing, nothing too, you know, severe, but that also completely fell to the wayside. Like I insisted there was no time for working out. So what happened to me was what always happens to me, which is that my back started hurting and I was having kind of carpal tunnel type wrist problems. And all of those things were held at bay with like my normal light exercise routine. All of that pain came back into my body during that year I was the associate chair. But really the mental weight of the job was absolutely the worst. So my responsibilities included reviewing all the English majors transcripts, their credit transcripts to both advise them and to make sure that the seniors had met their graduation requirements. So that was like this really weighty part of the job, which was keeping all the majors on track and also graduating the seniors. And like when I mean graduating the seniors, like basically I had to audit the seniors transcripts to make sure they met all the requirements And obviously, like, I didn't want anybody to be surprised to not graduate. So it was very weighty to, like, do it correctly and be able to tell students in advance, you know, look, here's what you have to do in order to graduate. And here's where you might get stuck. Right. So the potential of the role of being the associate chair was to make change in the department and to lead. But that potential was not realized because I was so in the kind of the weeds of student transcripts and graduating majors and trying to create processes and all of these things at the same time, trying to hold on to my line of research and be a good teacher. And so like the potential to lead and make change was there, but it was like trying to run with ankle weights on. 
and holding a sack full of cats while I did it. Like (laughs) that's what being an admin felt like to me. So in the end, all those big boundaries that I thought I had set for myself, I did not hold them. And I lasted about a year in the position, just one academic year. So all that big talk about like saving myself and boundaries, I didn't hold them. But I did learn an important lesson during this like short stint in admin. Just like the sum of your days equals your life, the sum of your everyday work activities equals your career. That's what I was saying earlier, right, about email. Do you want email to be the sum total of your career? (laughs) It was really doing that admin position that helped me see that. Because I realized how many hours of my day were were spent in these like transcript audits or dealing with upset faculty members and, you know, whatever else. All this paperwork, too. Like whenever we admitted students, we had to fill out paperwork and look at applications and all of this. And I just hated that part of it. And in the end, I was like, that paperwork is the sum total of my career if I stay in this position. So the good part of this story is that it really was a good lesson in boundaries. Like I thought that I had boundaries, but the reason that I got out after just one year was that I realized I just couldn't hold the boundaries. And it was that lack of control over the boundaries that meant my days were spent doing mostly what I hated doing, not just didn't like doing, but like straight up hated doing. So when you think about accountability, (laughs) when you think about accountability, think about how can you hold boundaries? If I had held on to boundaries, well, I just wasn't able to hold on to boundaries as an admin, and that might be true for you right now. But what I did was I took the proactive choice to get out of there. (laughs) I was like, no, I can't do this. I need more control over my boundaries. So we've talked about trust. We've talked about listening to your inner mentor, or as Alexandra Frazen says, your hut, your head plus gut. We've talked about boundaries and how it's hard to hold them, but absolutely necessary because the sum total of your career is the total of the activities that you are doing. And so if writing is not one of them, then that means that your voice in your field is not getting out there. And that your career won't be measured on that. It'll be measured on your email response time or some other sad metric, right? So that brings us to the last thing that I wanted to talk about today in terms of creating accountability that is not patriarchal. So trust in yourself, boundaries, and holding those boundaries, which is a kindness to you and to others. And finally, community. So I know that when people come into writing programs, a lot of times they're looking for that external accountability. But the way that they're looking for it is in that boot campy kind of way, right? Or maybe even that way of like, I spent money on this, which means I need to do what the program says. Okay, you know? (laughs) Or... I need to be held accountable. So I'm going to hire these coaches to hold me accountable. And instead, I think that if you're looking for external accountability, let's feminize that. (laughs) And the way that that gets feminized is by community over accountability. So that self-trust and the boundary setting and holding, those are processes of self-development personal and professional development that take time. They take time to learn and they take time to practice in order to make them part of your everyday life so that they don't feel foreign or painful when you're trying to do them. But you don't have to do that learning and that development alone. The culture of academia is like so famous for this like lone wolf idea, right? (laughs) So like particularly like In the social sciences and humanities, which I think is so weird, it's like the last place you would think because humanities, hello humans. Um, (laughs) 
But it is like where this lone wolf idea, right? This glorification or this pedestaling of the solo authored article. That is so much like an indication of this like lone scholar kind of image that we're supposed to be doing inside of academia. But even people in labs, when you write your dissertation in science, you are still the sole author of that dissertation. Even though that doesn't make any sense because labs don't work that way. Like labs are teams. <laughs> but there's still this like privileging of or or pedestaling of the I can do it by myself idea. And that's why it's radical to think about doing things in community inside of academia. That is radical. So instead of thinking about this external paternalistic patriarchal form of accountability, I want to invite you to think about a feminized version of accountability, which really looks like building self-trust, holding boundaries, and creating community, leaning on community when what you think you need is accountability, what you need is community. And let me be more clear about, about what I think that means. Women coming together and supporting each other in developing self-trust and holding firm boundaries, that is really, really powerful. And it beats this kind of quote-unquote accountability every day of the week. Building a community where you are working together with others to reinforce their personal journey towards more self-trust and better boundary holding, that is the powerful thing that you're looking for. When you think you're looking for accountability, like someone else telling you what to do from the outside, what you really need is people lifting you up, supporting you. Like I think of it like literally as a circle, people standing in a circle, in this case, people who identify as women or people who have been socialized as women standing in a circle and touching shoulders. And then you can lean, you know, and get that kind of support by leaning in your body weight into each other and you will remain standing because of that. And that's kind of the, the mental picture that I have when I think about these communities of support. So a community is a group of people who share a similar experience, but also who share values. So if we value that self-trust and we value that boundary setting and holding, then we can be in community with other people who are also doing that. And that will be a powerful change maker in our lives. So how does this apply to writing? Because you know I always want to bring it back there. <laughs> so writing is a solitary thing. It doesn't have to be, but it really, inside of academia, it often is, right? You know, I already mentioned like the dissertation. It's like your first giant solo work, right? The solo authored article as being like, more valuable for tenure and promotion than an article that's co-authored or written in a group. Those messages that we get all the time make us really focus on those solitary aspects of writing, the work that is between your brain and the blinking cursor. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can actually like write in community with other people <laughs> and find that powerful support there. That's exactly what we do in our co-writing program that is called Momentum. In that program, we literally hold space. I guess it's not literal space. It's Zoom space, virtual space. <laughs> we hold virtual space for people who identify as women and people socialized as women to come together and write side by side, virtually, but side by side. So what that means is that we are rejecting this idea of the lone wolf academic. We are rejecting the idea that the kind of accountability I need is somebody else obligating me to be there. 
What if instead of feeling obligated to do your writing, you felt inspired to do your writing? Because all your friends were going to be there when you got there. <laughs> like Because you were going to do it together. Because other people are counting on you to hold your boundaries around your writing time because they're doing it too. And when you show up for each other that way, instead of it being like this punitive kind of accountability, it is this feminized, life-giving, community-based accountability. So (laughs) if you are looking for some of that, if you are ready to do something kind of radical in your career, then I encourage you to come on over and check out our Momentum program. We are there every day, (laughs) not on the weekends, because also we are modeling rest. But we do have an always open link outside of our six scheduled co-writing times. We have an always open link so that if you wanted to make a friend who loved writing on a Saturday morning, you could go and write there together. I hope that you found a nugget of inspiration in today's podcast. I would love for you to come on in and join our Momentum program. You can find all the details on our website at kathymazak.com slash Momentum. And if you've listened all the way to the end of this podcast, I want to just plant a little secret seed in your ear. Next week, I'm going to start talking about what I really mean by radical change inside of academia. I can't wait to share these stories with you. And the reason I'm sharing the stories is I'm getting ready to open up enrollment in our Navigate program. And there is some, again, I'm saying this at the end of the podcast because I really want my most loyal podcast listeners to hear this kind of insider information. So when we open seats in our Navigate program, The subtitle of Navigate is Your Writing Roadmap, and it is a program that will help you not just make time to write, but will help you put writing in the center of your career and use your writing to design and shape your career. That's what Navigate does. It helps you do that by helping you create a writing system. We call it a soaring system. It helps you to strategically manage your pipeline and strategically manage your writing projects. So really, there are 10 systems that help you take control of your career and create for yourself an intentional path that comes from your writing, but is also driven by your writing. I'll talk to you more about it soon in upcoming episodes, but I wanted you to put it on your calendar because pre-enrollment is opening during the last week of April. And here's the thing about (laughs) pre-enrollment. You are going to get the first chance to grab some really exciting bonuses if you are a member of Momentum. So we have special stuff for our Momentum members when they move from the Momentum program into our Navigate program. So if you've been thinking about Navigate, I would definitely encourage you to join Momentum right now. And if you are already in Momentum, make sure you get on our Navigate wait list, which will be coming out soon. More details coming next week. I am sending you all big hugs. Think about self-trust, boundaries, and community, and I'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you so much for spending your valuable time loving on yourself and your writing by listening to this episode. If you're feeling pulled in a thousand directions and can't seem to carve out time to write, I've got a solution for you. Go grab my 10 ways to make time to write cheat sheet. Just go to kathymazak.com slash podcast dash time to learn my best quick tips for putting writing at the center of your career where it belongs. We'll link that up in the show notes. Just go to kathymazak.com slash podcast dash time.